been having this conversation here for the last month or so about uh, how the opportunities God has in front of us have, are outpacing our ability to keep up with it. And uh, in order to embrace those opportunities and, and uh, to take advantage, so to say, of what God has given us, uh, we have to raise up resources and we have to raise up relationships and uh, get ourselves organized as, as, a, as a family, as a church family. And that's what families do. Like when, when a family decides to tackle a project, when you decide to take a vacation or remodel the basement or whatever it is, you sit down at the family table and you talk about that and you get the finances organized, you kind of get the schedule and the goals organized and it's normal. And the, the church, the one, Jesus' favorite description of that is that it's his family with the family of God. And so from time to time, every three, four years, we sit down and at the family table and we organize ourselves uh, so that we know how to embrace what, what's next. And so uh, this conversation has been going on for a few weeks and you have on your uh, chairs, you have this card and this envelope. Grab that real quick. I just want you to be real aware of it. We're gonna use this at the end of the service and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make commitments to be a part of raising the resources part of this conversation. Now, if you are our guest this weekend, or you're very new to the family of, of Grace, this card is not for you. So want you to be here, want you to hear what God has drawn us to. I think you'll be excited about it, but do not want you to feel any kind of a pressure or any kind of a, a thing like I came for the first week and this is the week that they're collecting money, right? So it's not for you, but if you do come, I, I saw you, uh, if you do come, uh, I are here regularly and Grace is your church family, it is for you. And we've been talking about this for a little bit. We've been talking about praying, we've been talking about organizing, and I told you uh, four or five weeks ago that on this weekend, uh, we're gonna make commitments so that we can get ourselves organized as we go forward. So, so start to be aware of, of this, and I'll talk to you more about it here in a little bit. The reason that we do this stuff, and, when we, and we've talked about it, but if, it, if you're new to it, the reason that Christ followers would give financially is we see the generosity of Jesus. So the Bible is very clear that you do not give out of guilt, you don't give out of shame, you don't give out of compulsion, which just means somebody talked you into it. You give out of gratitude and you get out, give out of faithfulness. And the way we would say it is you give to vision. You, you see what God is doing and you want to participate in that. And so we've talked about it a bunch and we talked about, we showed you from the Bible that Jesus is the one who arranged it this way. When Jesus was doing his ministry with the 12 disciples, there were other faithful disciples that gave from their resources to support that ministry. And then later on, after Jesus established the church, the apostle Paul put that pattern in. And he wrote to the churches and he said, what I want you guys to do is I want you to set aside a portion every week so that there are resources there to extend mercy to the family of God, extend mercy outside the family of God, and then the resources to make the, the movement of God go forward. The, just the boat fare and the food and later on the buildings and all that kind of stuff to make the message of Jesus go forward. So from the jump, from Jesus forward, the people of God have always used their resources to do that. And at Grace, when we read those passages, we read them that way because the Bible says they took from their resources and then Paul says you should take from your resources. So that's why we don't do bingo at Grace. That's why we don't have catering services. That's why we don't name things after people because we really believe strongly that it's when we personally give of our resources that our hearts lock in to what God has, has called us to do. And, and you'll see that call again and again throughout the New Testament. In fact, I was reading this week from the book of Jude. So Jude is this little book in the New Testament 
And it's interesting because Jude was Jesus's brother. So Jesus was born of a virgin, born of the Virgin Mary, and he had an earthly father, Joseph, Mary's husband. And then Joseph and Mary had more children. And so the apostle James, who wrote a book in the New Testament, would have been Jesus's like half brother, one of his brothers. And Jude was another one of Jesus's brothers. And Jude, in his writings, he reinforces what Jesus said and what the apostle Paul and the apostle Peter said. He said it this way in, in his book, He's writing specifically to Christ followers. He said, I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. So he's writing specifically to those of us who are followers of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus yet, you're totally off the hook on this one. This is specifically for those of us who have received the generosity of Jesus, who would call him Lord and who would say, I'm a part of his family. So he's writing to them and he says this on down in verse 22 of his book. He says this, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment, show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sin that contaminates their life. And he's saying what Paul said, what Jesus said, what Peter said, what the whole second part of the Bible talks about. He's saying, listen, people of God, this is what you do. You show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. So many of us are young, like we're junior high, high school, or even children. Many of us are young in our faith. We started following Jesus just a little bit ago. And the Bible would say that sometimes our faith wavers. I have questions I don't have answers to. God's asked me to do something. I've never done that before. It's like a new thing for me. I'm trying to understand what that means. And so what the Bible says is that those of us who are further along in our faith, instead of looking at people like that with contempt, like when are you gonna grow up? Or like you just gotta believe, you just gotta have more faith. The Bible says you look at them with mercy. I'll I'll teach you. I'll show you, I'll journey with you. You're wrestling with that, I'm in. So we show mercy to each other. And then he says, and show mercy to people who are still struggling with their sin. So people who aren't followers of Jesus yet. So the the family of God, it's not us against them, it's us for them. And looking at people that we know and we love who have struggled with the same things that we struggled with, we're caught in the same patterns that we were caught in and looking and saying, I, I, I want to be merciful to you, not judge, judgmental or hateful towards you, but I want you to know about this love of Jesus that I found out about, and I want you to tell you about that. So mercy inside, mercy outside the family. And then Jude says, and... Listen, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. His wording there is incredible because it's strong. You, You snatch people from the flames of judgment. And basically what he's saying is he's saying, hey, listen, this gospel of Jesus Christ and you're receiving it or rejecting it is a spiritual life or death issue. You will be spiritually alive in Christ or spiritually dead and forever separated from him in hell. And that the imagery there of you snatch them from the flames of judgment, it's a it's a 911 imagery. They're about ready to fall in, and at the last second, you snatch them away. And Jude is saying to the early church and to us through the scripture, the same thing that Jesus said, the same thing the apostle Paul said, he, he's saying that the, the reason that my family exists is to, is to show mercy to one another, to love one another, and to show mercy to the people who are outside of the family still, and to bring them the good news of the gospel so, so that they can know who Christ is the way that, that you know Christ. And that's the point of the family of God. And so we looked the last couple of weeks, we're like, and that's, that takes resources, and that takes relationships, And that's what the resources are used for. So when we collect 
money here at Grace Church. We care for each other. And then we care for everything from homelessness to sex trafficking to addictions to kids who need school. We would care for our community, show mercy there. And we propel the message of Jesus. We tell other people about who Christ is and we tell them about the salvation that he offers. So here at Grace, what I've been talking to you guys about is there's opportunities to do that that are, that are kind of new to us right now that we want to engage because God has brought them our way. So when we talk about things like campuses, we're, we're not talking about let, let's have more Grace churches. We're talking about how do we get the truth of the gospel closer to people to snatch them from the flames of judgment? Here's the way the gospel works. The closer the gospel is, the easier it is to understand. The closer it is, the easier it is to understand. And the, the pattern that God gave us in the New Testament for getting the gospel close and getting it close permanently is local churches. So the gospel goes with the local church and then it stays there because the church stays there. So that's why we start churches. That's why we have nine campuses or nine churches that we started. That's why we're going to seek to start 10 or 20 more in the next 10 years. It's not the expansion of a brand. We're going to look and say, where is the gospel not clear and not easily accessible? And how can we get it there and keep it there? through the local church. So that's why we would do that. We're just trying to do what Jude would talk about or Paul or show or what Jesus did. Uh, same thing with youth and children. The, the reason that the youth ministry and the children's ministry has almost doubled in the last six months and the reason that we're trying to get more resources and more relationships around it because when you're in junior high or high school or you're a child, the younger you are, ready, the more your faith wavers because you're learning it, you're understanding it, you're wrestling with it. And when you, what you learn when you're seven, you wrestle with when you're 17. And so the Bible says, Jews says, have mercy on, on those folks and come around them. That's why we would teach them. That's why we would have spiritual mentors in their life. That, that's why we would have a, a sports program for them to be a part of. We're just surrounding them. And the sooner that we can surround them and help them know their faith and get a hold of their faith, the, be the better they are. It, it always cracks me up. Whenever I teach on um, sex, marriage, or debt, sex, marriage, or debt, every time I, I do that, I'll go out in the lobby and some older people will come up to me and they'll say to me, where were you when I was 20? And depending on your age, I wasn't even born yet. Some, some of you are aging, and not, not gracefully, but I mean, so, so I'm just saying like, like, right, so, but I get that all the time. How many of you wish that you knew then what you know now? Well, that's what we're doing. That's, that's what a, mm, it's what a youth ministry is. It's what a children's ministry is. It, it's just, it's teaching. And, and the, the more that we can teach, the, the more young, adult, young people and children want to be a part of that, the better. See? And, and that's, that's us, that's just us being the family of God, being the church. And collective, hmm, like we've talked a ton about collective, our young adult ministry. The collective, collective, that, that generation is taking the gospel and owning it and doing it. They're sharing their faith. They're, 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 they're moving on the gospel. They're volunteering to be the church planner, the missionary. They're reaching their friends in the dorm. They're not just a group of dynamic people. They are a group of people who are setting an example for their church and their life, their love, their speech, and their godliness. Exactly what the Apostle Paul told Timothy to do. And it's exploded. It's exploded. And so it needs resources. They need resources. 
They need, uh, they need pastors, they need scholarships, they need, they need resources be, because they, they are helping those whose faith are, is wavering and they're being merciful to those who don't know yet about the person of Jesus Christ. So it would be, it would be normal for a church to surround a group that's doing that. And then we've talked a lot about a special needs department. A special needs department is, is just us being merciful and us being loving. A special needs takes an enormous amount of resources that are customized. So if you, if, you, if you help someone with a special need, it takes, they don't necessarily just, can't just go to everything. So it's an enormous amount of resources that are customized. And we've looked and said as a church family, we're actually able to do that because of our size. We're actually able to do that. And we have a whole part of our community that has said, man, if you would do that for us, we would be so receptive. And we go, wherever we go, we go as Jesus people. We, we, Grace never like, is never not ourselves. But they said, man, if, if, you got, if you could do that, man, the difference that would make. And so they love the person with special needs and their caregiver who is often exhausted and, and worn out and and needs to have people around them. And all this list is, guys, and, and there's more, obviously. I didn't put everything on the list. But all this is, is us extending mercy and making the gospel go forward. And it, it's what every church, every healthy church in the New Testament did. It's how the good news of Jesus got to us. And we do that inside the church. We do that to each other. And then we do that outside the church and then we take the gospel and we create new churches because that's what makes the gospel so to say permanent in, a, in another community right and it's we're just trying to act on what the bible says and what what jesus would want now i told you as we've gone along that this this effort is a little bit different and so some of you have been around for a while and you're used to us doing seasons of vision as we do it every three or four years or so. And many times that season has been towards specific projects like we're gonna build a building or we're gonna start, uh, help to start restore drug rehab or we're gonna help start rehab that, that uh, combats sex trafficking or we're gonna go to a mission field like Chad Africa and we're gonna build a hospital there. So there's been all kinds of seasons that we've done that. And the way that we've done that over the years is we've said, let, let's, let's get resources around it. Let's get those resources around it for three or four years. And then we'll, we'll pay off that project, so to say, and we'll move on to the next one. This one is different because God has blessed so much that the ministries, the everyday workings of grace needs to have resources and relationships to continue to be effective. So we've said that this time, we need to be intentional with it. That this, this can't just be like, I have extra and whatever I have left over, I'll kind of throw in a pot. This is a first fruit, is what the Bible would call it. That we would give God our first and our best and there's an intentionality. Because when you start a children's ministry, you keep it. When you start a youth ministry, you keep it. When you start a special needs ministry, you keep it. It's not just done in three years. So there's an intentionality. There's a, a regularity to it. And so this is why we've said, boy, if we could go in and go on the Grace Link, set up online giving, reoccurring giving, that's how we, it's that setting aside the portion regularly so that commitments can be made. And then it's ongoing. It doesn't have a sunset. This isn't a practice or a project that we're, we're going after. This is a practice that we're implementing so that we can, we can push forward together as a church family. And what this card is, is it's documenting that, okay? So the, the reason that we document the financial side of this is because just like a, ch a family, we have to know where we're at financially. So this is, this is you communicating and saying, this is where I am, this is where we're gonna be as a household, either you individually or your family. 
and we'll take that. And when you communicate to, to like the leaders of the church, then we know, like, should we go ahead and start that special needs ministry? Should we hire that person? Should we make a commitment of scholarships for retreats, those kind of things? And it allows us to know how, how to move forward with it, okay? Now, whenever we do this, I always have a fear I always have a fear. And the fear, I, somebody was teasing me in between services. They said, are you afraid to ask for money? I'm like, no, I'm not afraid to ask for money because I'm inviting you into the best thing you're ever gonna spend money on in your life. So I don't, I don't have that fear. My fear is this. My fear is tied up as something that, that's called the bystander effect. And the bystander effect is actually a documented thing. You can Google it. The bystander effect would say this. The bystander effect would say, the more people who hear something, the less likely they are to respond individually. So the more people who hear or see something, the less likely they are to act on what they hear or they see. I'll give you an example of the bystander effect. So at my house, uh, the trash, the trash goes out every Sunday night. Hasn't changed for years. And so for Sunday night, the trash goes out. One of my children is responsible to take the trash out. He's really responsible about it once I remind him, which is usually about 1130 on Sunday night. Uh, and so he'll really be like, oh, I forgot. I'm like, I, I know, it's crazy. Like Sunday's coming. It's, there's actually like a seven-day Cycle. Anyway, so the, the trash goes out on Sunday night. So he's good. He, he's got a good attitude. He takes the trash out. Well, taking the trash out of our house is a little bit of an event because we have a really long driveway. And I like it that way. We live way back off the road, so you can't find us. And so we, we have this really long driveway. So we take trash out. Like, you got to, like, lug the trash out there, right? So it's a weird thing. It's his responsibility to take the trash out. But for some reason, maybe it's so I could tell you this story, I've never assigned anyone to take the trash cans back in. So the trash will go out to the curb, but it's really nobody's job to take them back in. Because here's my thinking. My thinking is, I have like 47 children. <laughs> and my thinking is, they all drive up and down the same driveway. And where our trash cans sit, our, the front of our driveway is kind of narrow. You kind of have to like squeeze through there. And so my thinking is, at 47 children, 46 of them are adults, and my thinking is, surely someone will notice that the trash cans are at the curb, and they will bring them back in. 46 children and my wife, so that's 47, and so I'm like, surely somebody will notice this. So I started to do a count in my head of how many days the trash can set at the curb. And I thought, they, it's, it's Monday, they left them, oh, they'll get them Tuesday. Nope, Wednesday, nope. And they're driving in, out, back, forth. Nope, 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 nope. And usually what happens is usually Sunday afternoon after church, I bring the trash cans back in so that the trash that's been set in the garage can be loaded in the trash cans so that my son can take the trash back out. So I've been frustrated with this many times over the years. I've gone so far as to pull my truck over and pull the trash cans into the middle of the driveway, <laughs> blocking the driveway. And I'll think, surely this will spark, oh my, this must be heavy on my father's heart. I will get the trash cans. And when I come home, what I see is I see the tire marks in the yard where they went <laughs> around the trash cans, right? Okay, that's, that's the bystander effect. The bystander effect is we all see it, we all think about it. It's even a part of our lives. Somebody will do something. Now ready? The bystander effect is horrible in churches and very common. And it sounds like this. It sounds like this. Um, it's really neat that the church has a heart for people with special needs. There's this, there's this group of people somewhere out there, and they have a heart for something, and they should do that. The bystander effect sounds like this. Um, I'm really glad Jeff is talking to those rich people. They need to give more money. I don't have any. I mean, not after my third trip to Chipotle this morning, but I, 
Not, not with the $30 of coffee I walked into the church with, right? But those rich people, I'm really glad. The bystander effect sounds like this. Um, what difference does my contribution make? Are they really gonna miss? The bystander effect sounds like this. It's really neat that those young adults are sharing their faith. People need to know about Jesus. And I'm observing them doing it, but I'm not acting on the example that maybe they're setting. See? And the bystander effect is I hear it, I know it, and in my mind, I even agree with it, but in my mind, so somebody else is doing that, right? And this plays out even in our relationship with God, I find it really interesting how Jude wrote this, this letter that he wrote. So just look at his grammar with it. And he says, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. So I find it interesting. He doesn't say, and the church should, or the family of God should, or somebody ought to. He looks, he's, he's writing it. That letter would have been received into a very, very small group of people who would have heard it in a very personal way. And you should show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. You should rescue others, snatching them from the flames of judgment. You show mercy to still others, see, and Jude would do this, Jesus would do this, the Apostle Paul would do this. He'd be like, no, 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 when, when I'm talking about showing mercy to people inside the family and outside the family, and I'm talking about showing, rescuing people from hell, I'm talking to you. Like, don't drive around the trash cans. Like, I'm, I'm, I mean you, and you participating in it. I was talking to a friend in between services just after morning service. And he was talking to me about how he's excited about how he's meeting people and making a difference. He said, he said, you know, I came to Grace and I came to Grace hurting. And then I realized I was frustrated that the church wasn't reaching people. And then I realized I was the church. And I said to him, I said, yeah, that's, that's the weird thing about a healthy church. A healthy church is a great place to come and heal. But if you're not careful, you can come and hide. And you become a bystander. And you watch other people give their lives away. You watch other people make sacrifices. And you become an attender when in fact you're actually a part of a family and God wants to do something through you. And as he does something through you, he does something in us, but you can't be a bystander with it. So my fear is as we talk about these things, as I kind of share these needs and opportunities with you, my fear is that you hear it you agree with it, you're even kind of proud that your church has these problems and has these opportunities. But you wouldn't see them as your own. I'm young, I'm old. You'd find a reason, almost unconsciously, to pull yourself aside and that's not that's not needed for me. And guys, let me tell you, at Grace Church, it's not the way that we work. There's not a tech billionaire here unless you hit it big this week and I don't know yet and you should tell me. We're just folks from Akron, Ohio. And the way that we do stuff is we all get our shoulder under it and when we do that, God works in powerful ways. My, I've been here a long time and uh, started the Bath Campus 24 years ago. Heidi and I did. 
And so um, my files, I had a lot of files from sermon series and research and blah, blah, blah. A bunch of my files are all paper still because I'm old. I've aged remarkably gracefully, Mona Lisa-ish. Uh, but really, really old files. And so one of my assistants has been taking those files and she has me go through them. And then the important things she scans in and we make it digital and everything else gets thrown away. So last week she put a file on my desk and um, she's like, you should, you should go through this one. So I went through it real quick, bunch of stuff that could be thrown away. And in the middle of a bunch of stuff that could be thrown away, I found these three pieces of paper. And when I pulled out these three pieces of paper, I I looked at her and I said, oh my goodness, these are very, very important pieces of paper. I didn't even know I had them anymore. And so these these three pieces of paper are, are handwritten notes, notes that I wrote for a meeting that we called. So what was going on was in 2005, the Bath Campus would have been five years old we had just turned five years old, and we had grown like crazy. It was nuts. And back then, the whole building was just the cafe. The, the A-frame was the auditorium, and we just, that was all that there was. And so we were meeting out there, and God was working in really powerful ways. All kinds of people were coming to Christ. Uh, the, the campus, the congregation was very young, lots of young adults, lots of young families. That's all that there, there was. But people coming to know Jesus, people being baptized, it was just insane what was going on and, and, and how exciting it was. And so we had grown and grown aggressively. And, and um, uh, in late 2004, we knew that we had, we, we knew that our opportunities were outpacing our ability to keep up with it. And so we started doing some research, thinking about what we needed to do next to keep up with our abilities. And the short version is we figured that out and we figured up that it was gonna cost $2 million to act on those opportunities. Well, we were only four years old at the time. And so I was like, the the elders looked at me and I was like, I don't know if we can raise $2 million or not. I have no idea. We're all young, we're all poor. We're brand new as a family, I don't know. So we hired this consultant to come in. And this guy came in, I was like, hey, could you do this research for me? So he looked at our giving and he interviewed people and did whatever he does with numbers, you know, nerd stuff. And so he, he does all this kind of stuff. And he comes back to me with a report about that thick. And uh, my associate at the time was was a guy named Pastor Tom. And so Pastor Tom and I were the only pastors. We had interns and stuff, but we were the only pastors at the time. And so he came back in with Pastor Tom and and, uh, he sat down. He goes, I want to go through this report with you. And he said, I got really good news for you. I was like, okay. And he goes, "Uh, you have within you and your history and the families, et cetera, he said, you have within you the ability to raise $1 million. And I looked at him, I said, well, that's gonna be a problem because we need $2 million. And he said, well, he said, according to my research, you can't do it. I said, okay. So he left and Tom and I went to lunch and we took the report with us and we're leafing through the report and uh, kind of trying to, process it and understand it and and um i said tom i said if we don't if we don't make this next move like the dream's going to be over like we we have to make this move and so tom looked at me he goes what do you think we should do and i said well i think we should ignore the guy i think we should ignore the guy and go forward anyways and after tom was done choking um we had to heimlich him he, he, he was like, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm with you. He goes, what do we do? I said, well, let's get everybody together. Let's get everybody together. Let's get the family together. Let's have a family meeting and we'll tell them. So these are the notes of that meeting. February 20th, 2005. And I walked in to that little cafe And there was about 200, 250 of us there. And I took the report. And I said, here's the report. All you people who know how to do math can look at it if you want. 
I said, but it's gonna tell you that what we feel like we should do, we can't do. And I said, I, I think we should ignore the guy. And in my notes, I wrote down some dreams. And I said in my notes, I said, if we ignore the guy, we could have a third campus. We have nine now. But I'm like, we could have another one. Can you imagine what that'd be like? That, that was the most insane thing. We have a third one. I said, we could trade interns and residents. And we could train people up to be church planners and missionaries. And we had a program back then, we called it 412. And so we could get behind 412. We got all these young adults and they're willing and they're able. And we could train them, we could send them out. And I said, we didn't, we didn't even have life groups yet. I said, we could, have, we could have life groups. We called them real life groups back then. And I said, we, God could do this. And then I wrote this in my notes. I said, if we do this, we could set in place a 10-year foundation that God would use for the next 45 years. In the last 10 years, we've started seven new churches. In the next 10, I really believe we could start 10 to 20 more. Back then, that was all just insane. And then I wrote down this statement and I said it to these 250 people. It's in my notes. I said, right now, we have to decide if we wanna be a part of something special or a part of something supernatural. Because life is good right now. All kinds of people making real life change, plenty of resources. And we could live right here and we could enjoy ourselves for a long time and then one day we can talk about and remember how God used to show up. Or we could ignore the guy and step out on faith and be at a place that we're only gonna survive if God shows up. But we have to decide. And then I said this. It's in my notes. I said if we wanna be a part of something supernatural we have to pray because we're gonna get in way over our heads. I said, we have to love the lost. Something bigger's gotta drive us. And if I read the book right, it's a life and death thing. I said, we have to move together. We have to move together. And to be unified in it. And then I said, and you have to own the vision. And I remember standing there and I looked at everybody and I said, this, and look at me, ready? This cannot be, we support you, Jeff. We have to own it. We have to own it. And I looked at those people and I said, if we own it, then I actually don't think there's a limit of what God can do. But we have to decide. I didn't say this, but what I was saying was you can't be a bystander. 
And those people, a bunch of young adults, that was the bulk of the church. His grace was started from a young adult ministry, so the bulk of the people were young adults. And then a bunch of people like Heidi and I with the kids, we started to pray and we started to sacrifice and they came up with $2 million. And we would do, I'm not joking here, we wouldn't. I get together with friends and we would literally pray over our minivans. Like, Betsy's gotta live. Because <laughs> I just committed all the money. Like, we, would, we prayed minivans into, like, healing. I don't know, not really. But you know what I'm saying? Like, that, that's what it was down to. And you look back now, and, and it seems melodramatic. And it seems silly. A third campus. But we are a people of faith. And when the people of God, the family of God, moves out in faith together, I believe it pleases God. And then God empowers it. But you have to step out. Or it's somebody else's story. If you want your own story, you gotta sacrifice for it. If you, if you wanna see your God, if you wanna see God empower you in your God dreams, you have to act on your God dreams. And if I read the book right, that's always terrifying. It's terrifying. But when God shows up, it's powerful. See? And he alone gets the glory for what he does. And when I read the book, all the way back to Jesus, that's the way he set it up. It's the way he set it up. And it's what he invites us into. Okay. Now this thing. The Bible is crystal clear that you do not give out of shame. It's crystal clear that you do not give out of guilt. It's crystal clear that you do not give out of manipulation if you make a commitment to Grace Church, you will not get a new Ferrari. Your hair will not grow back. There's many who have tried that one. It doesn't work. You also don't give out a compulsion. You don't give because Jeff just shared his emotions with you. You give out of gratitude. You give out of faithfulness and you give because you wanna see the gospel go further, okay? So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray, as is gonna play a prayer for us that you can sing along with, pray along with if you want. But we want this to be a, a worshipful moment. This is this is the way giving works in the scripture. It's, it's a return to God or a surrender to God. It's an act of worship. And so we're just gonna take a breath. If you're our guest, pray and connect with God. Don't worry about the card. If you're new to grace, you don't trust us yet, don't worry about the card. This is kind of a family conversation. And we've had it for a month now. So I want you to pray. I want you to think, and then I want you to decide if you haven't already how you want to give. Guys, listen. On the back there, it says three things. I'm going to start, I'm going to increase, I'm going to continue. Please listen to me. Ready? If you already give faithfully and sacrificially, 
and you look at me and say, Jeff, what we just, we're given all we can give. I don't want you to hear anything from me but thank you. I want you to hear encouragement. I want you to hear that God is pleased. I want you to hear thank you. Here's the thing. Those of you who give the most and the most sacrificially are usually the ones who hear give the clearest. And if you want to give more, you do that. But there is no pressure and thank you. Some of you, some of you need to increase. Guys, some of you, when the nest emptied and life changed, you went to the bench and you need to get off that bench. You need to get off it financially and then I'm gonna to talk to you about getting it off it relationally. It, it, that, that little break in life needs to be over. And so some of you need to get back in the game and then some of you have never been in it. You've never been in it. And you've enjoyed the blessings of the family, but you haven't participated yet in the family. And, and this is just spiritual maturity. It, maybe you're young, maybe you're not. It just, it's when you came to Christ. See? So you need to get in it. All right, so I'm gonna pray, and Inez is gonna play this song, and I'm gonna talk to you again, then we're gonna collect these, okay? So you can pray over them, fill them out, but we'll give you a, We'll take a breath here, okay? So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, we just want to, in this moment, we want to respond to you. We want to be led by you. But God, we want to give to you in gratitude and because you've given to me. So God, if you right now would tear down every compulsion, every temptation of shame, every temptation of guilt, if you would tear that away from us. And God, just let us see your heart and, and help us to connect our heart and our treasure to you. So for all the right reasons and all the healthy reasons, God, would you motivate us? So God, as we pray individually and as we think and even fill things out, would you in these moments just stir in our hearts?